But strangely enough, just as we were talking, I, the answer to that question popped into my head. I act as if God exists. Now, you can decide for yourself whether that means whether, that I believe in him, so to speak. But I act as if he exists. So that's a good enough answer for that. Then with regards to these other issues, the divinity of Christ, well, I would say the same problems with the question formulation obtain. What do you mean by divine? And also, what do you mean by Christ? These are very, very difficult questions. Now, I believe that, for all intents and purposes, I believe that the Logos is divine. Insofar as we, if, if by divine you mean of ultimate value, of ultimate transcendent value, yes, it's divine. It's associated with death and rebirth, clearly, because the Logos dismantles you and rebuilds you. So that's what happens when you make an error. When you make an error, some part of you has to go. That's a sacrifice. You have to let it go. Sometimes it's a big part of you. It's, it's, sometimes it can be such a big part of you that you actually die, right, instead of dying and being reborn. Is there something more than merely metaphorical about the idea of, being, of dying and being reborn? Yes, there is, because those are associated with physiological transformations. How, what's the ultimate extent of that? That's a good question. You know, the question is, what happens to the world around you as you, embo as you increasingly embody the Logos? And the answer to that is, we don't know. We don't know what the ultimate level of it is. Now, the hypothesis is, and it's a hypothesis that extends to some degree to Buddha as well, the hypothesis is that there has been one or two individuals who managed that, and that in their management of that, they transcended death itself. Well, then you might ask yourself, well, what do you mean by transcended death? Well, in the case of Christ, let's assume he was a historical figure for the, for the time being, which I think is the simplest thing to assume. Um, I think there's sufficient evidence to conclude that. You could conclude otherwise, but I, personally, I feel that there's sufficient evidence to conclude that. Um, did he, is his resurrection real? Well, his spirit lives on. That's certainly the case. In what sense do you mean spirit, just to qualify that? How, well, let, let's imagine that a spirit is a pattern of being. And we know that patterns can exist, in, patterns can be transmitted across multiple substrates, right? Vinyl, electronic impulses, air, vibrations in your ear, neurological patterns, dance. It's all the translation of what you might describe as a spirit, right? It's, it's that pattern. It's independent of its material substrate. Well, Christ's spirit lives on. It's, 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 a, it's had a massive effect across time. Well, is that an answer to the question? Did his body resurrect? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what happens to a person if they bring themselves completely into alignment. I've had intimations of what that might mean. We don't understand the world very well. We don't understand how the world could be mastered if it was mastered completely. We don't know how an individual might be able to manage that. We don't know what transformations that might make possible. I'm going to do a series on the Bible. One, that's one of the things I want to investigate more thoroughly and formulate my thoughts about more thoroughly, because it is a crucial issue. A friend of mine said, and I wouldn't describe him, he's certainly not the sort of person that you would describe as a classic Catholic. He's an extraordinarily well-educated individual, and he's come back to Christianity <laughs> with the most vicious of internal battles. You know, and he said to me, he was the same person who made the comments earlier about the dominance hierarchy, and, and so he's very insightful. You know, he said that it all falls apart unless you believe in the divinity of Christ and in the resurrection of Christ. And he meant that in a very fundamental way. And um, there's a way in which that's true, but I don't know exactly what it means yet. Like the metaphorical element of that to me is quite clear. The death and rebirth idea, yeah, I mean, you see that echoed all over. It's, it's the most recent manifestation of that idea, is, or one of the most recent manifestations, popular manifestations, is in the Harry Potter series, because it's full of deaths and rebirths of the central it, hero. Is it not a manifestation of hope for something beyond the finality with which, uh, of which we've become inescapably conscious. Well, yes, and of course that's, that's the Freudian critique, right? He just thought about it as a wish fulfillment. Although that, the problem with that theory is, well, you know, people also generated up the idea of hell, which doesn't, you know, you could say, well, that's a convenient place to put your enemies and still put it in the wish fulfillment framework, but I think that's absurdly cynical. I mean, right, right, people who believe in hell are terrified of hell about for, for themselves, and in my estimation, they should be, because I also believe in hell, although what that means, again, is, you know, subject to interpretation. Lots of people live in hell, and lots of people create it. But it, beyond the, the sort of the basic Freudian, you know, snide interpretation, yeah. is it not a, a belief in the identification with something that transcends your limited Ooh, existence? Yes, definitely. That's well, but it's funny too because in the more Christian formulations, there's an insistence on the resurrection of the body, which I find extremely interesting. You know, even the say more sophisticated deist types are kind of willing to go along with the idea that there might be something eternal, transcendent about consciousness or about the spirit or the soul, something like that. But they're, they're certainly not willing to go beyond that. But there's this very peculiar emphasis in Christianity on the resurrection of the body, which is a glorification of the body, which is quite interesting. You know, it's not something you want to dismiss so, so rapidly, because it is a glorification of the body and an indication of the necessity of the body, of that limitation. Could, could that not be an instance of what we were describing earlier in terms of an instanti a specific instantiation 
of a general principle. Yeah, right. It's the instantiation itself that makes it real. The body is the most real thing that we experience on, on, on an individual. Right, well, it, yeah, and it's real in part because it's, it's limited, right? right? It has limitations. So the focus on the mythological representation of the body is resurrected as saying, this is more real, this is just as real as as you can imagine. Yes, yes. Well, it's an elevation of the material, interestingly enough, right? Not a denial of the material, an elevation of the material. It's a very interesting idea. Um, and as I said, I want to explore that more because I'm not, I'm not fully comfortable with my, my ability to bridge the gap between the metaphorical and the real. Although I think that the way that I described it is as close as, it's as close as I can come right now. I had a dream once, and I'm speaking psychologically here, not, not theologically. I had a dream once. I was in the cemetery of an old church, an old cathedral, um, surrounded by the graves, and there were indentations in the grounds where all the graves were, and all of a sudden the, the graves started to open, and it was a graveyard where great people, great men of the past had been buried, and so the grave opened and a, an armed king stood up, and then another grave opened and another armed king stood up, and this happened all around me, and these were very formidable figures, right? They were the great heroes of the past, and after a number of them appeared on the scene, they looked around and saw each other, and being warrior types, they immediately started to fight. And the question is, what stops the great kings of the past from fighting? And I had a revelation after the dream. I can't remember if it was part of it, but yes, it was part of the dream. They all bowed down to the figure of Christ. I thought, and then I woke up and I thought, what in the world does that dream mean? What in the world could that possibly mean? And then I, I, I understood it. I understood that if you have 20 kings, let's say, and you took the thing that was most king-like about each of them, and then you combined it into a single figure, then you'd get a single figure of transcendent heroism, of transcendent good. And it's a tenant of the Jungian school of psychology, let's say, that that figure of transcendent good is symbolized by the image of Christ. And the purpose of that image is so that even the tyrannical king has someone to bend his knee to. And that's absolutely vital. I mean, you don't have to approach it from a religious perspective, although you inevitably do, because when you speak of things at this level, that's what happens. But you need an image of the transcendent embodied good to, to serve as something that unites the great tyrants of the past. It's something like that. It's an, emergent, it's an emergent vision of embodied unity. And it's a psychological necessity. It's a sociological necessity. And I think it bears very strongly on your question about why is it that people matter. It's the, the, the classic Western ad answer to that, the Judeo-Christian answer to that is because you have a spark of divinity within you and that divinity is a reflection of this transcendent good and it's obligatory for me to recognize that in you and vice versa if we're going to inhabit the same territory without mayhem peacefully and with the ability to cooperate now you might say well the mere fact that a transcendent image is necessary as a uniting figure doesn't prove the reality of that image but I would say, well, yes, but it doesn't disprove it, and it strongly hints at something more profound, especially when you also ally it with the observation that the encounter with something truly admirable produces the instinct of awe, and that's not a rational instinct. It's an irrational instinct, but it's a marker that you're in the presence of something greater than yourself, and it's not something that you have voluntary control over. It's something that overtakes you, and it could easily be a reflection of the truth. Now, you can, make a biological you can make a biologically reductionistic argument about that, but it starts to become extraordinarily difficult because you, you, you enter into the realm where these transcendent experiences of religious significance and awe are a phenomenological and psychological reality, and it's not easy to explain why that's the case. So... Can I just say that I'm, I'm somewhat... You got it. And I think this is why it's bothered me to answer this question. It's like, what right do I have to say that, to make that claim? I believe in God. Well, what's the claim? Is that the claim that I'm a good person somehow? Because you think that if you believed in God, actually, like, like seriously, that you'd be a good person, like, right now. Because, well, <laughs> well, for obvious reasons, I would think. And so if that hasn't happened in some sort of miraculous sense, so that you're the best person you could possibly imagine being on an ongoing basis, and then terrified of, of deviating from that path in a serious manner, then... I don't see why you have the right to say that you believe in God. You know, one of the things Nietzsche said about Christianity, he was a great critic of Christianity, although also a great friend in a, in a very peculiar way, um, in that sometimes your best friend is the one who points out your weakest um, properties, let's say. He said, as far as he was concerned, there was only one Christian, and he died on the cross. And, and that's, that's a, you know, perhaps an extreme statement, but one worth giving some consideration to. It's like, well, then you look at what are, what are you called upon, let's say, if you're going to proclaim yourself as a believer, you know? And, and I thought about this a lot, as I've gone through the Old Testament, I did a bunch of lectures last year, and so what are you called upon? Well, you're called upon initially to act out the spark of divinity that's within you by confronting potential with the logos that's within you, which means to take 
the opportunities that are in front of you in the potential future and to transform it into the present in the best possible way using truth and courage and careful articulation as your, as your, as your, as your, as your guide. So that's the first thing you're called on to do. That, that's a major deal there. That's a tough one. And then the second is to make the proper sacrifices. That's the Cain and Abel story. It's like you, you want something, you genuinely want it, you want to set the world straight, then you let go of what's necessary and you pursue. You let go of what isn't necessary, no matter what it is. No matter what it is. That's what it means to believe. That's what it means. It doesn't, it doesn't mean to state it. It means to act it out. And unless you act it out, you should be very careful about claiming it. And so I've never been comfortable saying anything other than I try to act as if God exists because God only knows what you'd be if you truly believed. I mean, if you think about it in some sense, that's the central idea in Christianity is that if you were capable of believing, it would be a transfiguring event, a truly transfiguring event. And I know people experience that to one degree or another, but we have no idea what the limit of that is. And we have no idea what the possibility is within each person if they lived a life that was maximally courageous and maximally truthful. You know, because maybe you're running at 60% or 70% or 20% and at cross purposes to yourself. And God only knows what you'd be if, if you believed. And so, well, I act, I try to act like I believe, but I'd never claim that I manage it because it's too, it's, it's a lot to manage properly. And you have to be careful about claiming to manage things that you can't manage. And so that's part of the answer to that question. It's a great answer as it happens. So, okay, so you can think about Christ from a psychological perspective, and the, the, crit the critic, my critic, this particular critic that I've been reading, said, well, that, that doesn't differentiate Christ much from a whole sequence of dying and resurrecting mythological gods. And, of course, people have made that claim in comparative religion. Joseph Campbell did that, and Jung to a lesser degree, I would say, but Campbell did that. But the difference, and C.S. Lewis pointed this out as well, the difference between those mythological gods and Christ was that there's a, there's a representation of there's a historical representation of his, of, of his existence as well. Now, you can debate whether or not that's genuine. You can debate about whether or not he actually lived and whether there's credible objective evidence for that, but it doesn't matter in some sense because this, well, it does, but there's a sense in which it doesn't matter because there's still a historical story. And so what you have in the figure of Christ is an actual person who actually lived plus a myth. And in some sense, Christ is the union of those two things. The problem is, is I probably believe that, but I don't okay. know. I don't, I'm amazed at my own belief and I don't understand it. Like, because I've seen... Sometimes the objective world and the narrative world touch. You know, that's union synchronicity. Yeah. And I've seen that many times in my own life. And so in some sense, I believe it's undeniable. You know, we have a narrative sense of the world. For me, that's been the world of morality. That's the world that tells us how to act. It's real. Like, we treat it like it's real. It's not the objective world. But the narrative and the objective world touch. And the ultimate example of that, in principle, is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, um, that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, and partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ, or if you believed that history and, and let's say the narrative make meet, let's Both, say. I think, yeah. I think you, because when you believe that, you buy both those stories. You believe that yeah. the narrative and the objective can actually touch.